where you are from. My name is Marcella Gilbert, and I am an enrolled tribal member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. And can you tell us what brought you to Standing Rock? Um, my involvement with Standing Rock um, began in August of 2016. But I, I, I do want to say that I, um, I grew up in a family of activists. So I grew up in the American Indian Movement. So Standing Rock wasn't new to me. My mother and my brother are Wounded Knee 1973 veterans. My brother was 10 years old at that occupation. Uh, my mother was involved with the um, Alcatraz occupation in 69 or whenever it was. So, and then my aunts and my uncles and you know, so I have, I grew up with that, with being, you know, standing being aware and standing up for our people. So when Standing Rock happened, my hunka aunt contacted my mother and asked her to come and help because she was getting ready to put the call out for the Ocheti Shakoi. And so, um, of course, my mom was like, okay. And I was like, okay, what are you doing? What's going on, you know? And so I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm coming. You know? <laughs> so, so that's how I ended up, ended up at Standing Rock. So I was there August 8th, I believe. And when I got when when we got there there was one tent. Um, probably about this big or bigger. And three outhouses and 150 people or more. And so I you know and then I stayed there till till um, December, when the when the um, when the veterans had all come and, and and Obama made the decision to you know stop everything, then I left after that. I came back in January after the twentieth when when Trump got in, but I didn't stay. Just came back for a week or two and then left again. What was Sandy Rock like? Like, what were your everyday kind of uh, routine? Um, well, it's like camping with a thousand people. <laughs> you know, you know, you find out where the outhouses are and where's the water. And and Standing Rock had um, seven kitchens, community kitchens. So, if you weren't cooking in your own camp you can go and eat at any of the community kitchens. So there was always somewhere to eat. People always had something something to eat, somewhere to go to eat. Um, one of the things that, that impressed me about being at Standing Rock was the level of um, the standard at which people raised themselves to because the everybody treated each other like relatives so no matter who you were you were greeted you know as a relative hey how's it going you know everybody was friendly everybody was like what do you guys need you know I I have this skill I can help with this you know and so well those guys over there need need people like you you know so it was like everybody treated each other like relatives and so we took care of each other on no matter what level it was and so and the fact that it was based in spirituality I think that allowed people to to um, people had the freedom to believe in their spirituality the freedom to believe in their religions and it allowed them to behave at a higher standard as that truly spiritual being that we are and so that really came out and people treated each other well you know and and the fact that the world brought their prayers there we can't forget that that's huge every day there was people a nation from somewhere 
or a group of people from somewhere who came not just to be a part of Standing Rock but bring their prayers to pray to pray for the water because we all need it you know this isn't just an indigenous issue this isn't just you know the hukapapa on Standing Rock it isn't you know it's everybody's issue we all need water and I think that common ground is what allowed us all to be good relatives to each other and it was based in spirituality so that was um, that right there is what held allowed us to be good to each other and to think ahead and think of what our future is going to look like because many of us thought um, we were going to win you know it was um, we were prepared to stay there until we did and of course the the um, government and the the you know the militia and whoever else you know we could give them all these all these labels and terms but it was the government that that criminalized us no matter what we did we were criminalized and so people you know the other thing that that ha that I noticed at Standing Rock that is just you know not it's just something that I'm used to seeing but the resistance was family oriented it wasn't just a bunch of Indian men or a bunch of young Indian women or just the young people or you know our leaders or whatever it was it was family based whole families went there and so if your family is dedicated to to staying until the end and many of them did by criminalizing us on I mean you know you can't camp there or you're gonna you're gonna get a felony charge you can't camp on that side because you're gonna get a felony charge you can't you know you can't park your car here you can't make a fire here you can't you know go to the bathroom I mean everything was was a felony and so if you're the breadwinner of your family you're not going to you're not going to jeopardize your position by going to jail for who knows how long you know so that's why people left a lot you know not everybody but you know people left because they had families to take care of so i think um that is powerful the, that the fact that we came there as families you know everybody brought everybody brought everybody it wasn't just a few or and people quit their jobs people moved there um, when the school kicked off in the second week I spent hours in the donate in the in the tent where all the school donations were coming and one of the um, women she's a teacher and I can't remember where she's from she's a non-indian person but she came and um, she, oh she came to deliver school supplies and she never left She's just like, how can I leave? This is what's happening. This is where the need is. And she's willing to teach kids. So, God, I wish I could remember her name. I can't believe I forgot her name. We spent hours in that tent, you know, organizing thousands of boxes of, or, you know, a thousand crayons, <laughs> tubs of, of markers and, you know, but so the generosity was amazing the generosity of the world and that's the other thing you know that's the other thing about standing rock it it allowed people to to be free to be a relative or to be the generous human beings that we are and and the world took care of us up there through their generosity we didn't have a need for anything you know so and and we also we also um, realized how how um, nurturing it is to live simply you know we weren't worried about our colored TVs and our microwaves you know we had a bedroll and our mattress and our our camp tent uh, you know our camp um, stove and coolers everybody had tons of coolers I mean you know it was camping but it wasn't like well I need a I need a an, I need an iPhone and an iPad to match you know no one was talking about that you know 
so so the fact that that you know that's one of the things that I realized too is how how easy and and how um, you know nurturing it is to just live simply and and you know because we were there for because we decided to live at that higher standard everybody picked up trash you know it was a clean camp it was a very clean camp and you know just walking from your camp to the bathroom you picked up trash or if you're walking to the kitchen or if you're going to security or wherever you're going you just pick it up along your way you know so I think everybody's behavior was like I said we all we all behaved at a higher standard and so daily life was awesome there because every day there was a group of people coming and every day someone was bringing a flag that they wanted to hang every day someone was bringing their medicine that they wanted to or their prayers that they wanted to leave there for the water and for the people and every day people were down at the river saying their prayers and making their offerings and you know the horse riders would be riding I mean it was so cool it was just a really cool experience to have all the horses there and all the young people and you know all the cooks and all the food and every day there was an action you know and and what I mean by action was just a, a march from camp up to the front line because people were coming from all over the world and they wanted to be a part of it so every day at noon they would have a walk and like a, like one um, one of the walks they had the elders lead. Another one of the walks they had the um, they had the um, pipe carriers, and people who had their their um, pipes led the walk. Or, you know the you know the horses. You know wh whoever. Everybody had an opportunity to participate at that level, so they could carry their flags and their prayers and go up to the front line. So it was it was. Um, was so organic but so organized you know people's people's abilities just came came out and they were they weren't afraid to help they weren't afraid to take the lead they weren't afraid to you know to pick up trash you know it was just so empowering for everybody so it, it was some it's it's something that I'll never forget and it's and it's something that I um, I hope we'll, we'll be able to recreate at home or wherever we are, you know, that we can rebuild, we can build on the, on the spirit of Standing Rock and create communities that are like that, where young people are safe and elders are taken care of and, and men are working and women are providing and, you know, whatever. Because there, you know, the, one of the things was, please wear a skirt. And so, there was a tent set up with donated sewing machines and women were making skirts for women who didn't have them. So, you know, just stuff like that that just popped up and whatever the need was, people did it. There was a whole, there was a whole uh, tent where they would help you make your flags or your, your banners or, you know, and, and of course they had training. There was a, there was training for um, what do you do when you get arrested? Or how do you, how do you, um, how do you behave in a non-violent action? You know, so people were actually getting trained on, on being a part of a non-violent action. And then there was a group of women, white women, who organized um, daily orientations for people who were coming because every day there was someone who was just got there. You know, and. And so they organized these daily orientations that involve um, how do you behave? You're on indigenous land. This is this is why we're here for you know we're trying to protect our water. A little bit of history of the treaty, 1851 treaty. But they did this whole thing on white privilege, which I thought was amazing, you know. And it, and and it, I think it's more powerful to have white people teach about white privilege than it is to have a person of color. You know, the, the dynamic there doesn't fit, at least in my eyes. But when you have a white person teaching white people about white privilege, 
it's way more powerful and way more meaningful for everybody. Because for, as a person of color or an Indian person, we're watching white people keep their own people in check so that we don't have to worry about that. They're doing it. And then, and then they, you know, they're empowering each other. By, so I thought that was amazing. You know, these young white women organizing this, you know, and everybody wanted to go. Everybody wanted you know, white privilege. I want to go check it out, you know, and what does that mean? And so it became a, a word, a phrase that everybody knew. You know, what is white? People started thinking about that. What is that? You know, and, and how am I involved in that? You know, so it was it was powerful. It was powerful. And then, you know, the 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 um, medical support that came. You know, there was healers, all kinds of healers. You know, mas mas massages and uh, reiki and s using using crystals and hot stones and I mean, all of it, acupuncture and all of it. And so they had, you know, four or five yurts set up, and each one of those was something different. And there and there was a a year specifically for midwives, so women, young women who were pregnant could go get um, education and counseling and resources, uh, you know, vitamins and and then s set up a time if they wanted to have their baby there. So I mean, the it 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 was so organic and so people just took responsibility for what needed to happen next, you know, and the me the medical they started out by being like the EMT type, you know, who would come in and and um, take care of the, the ones who come from the front line who had, who had been, you know, tear gassed or whatever, you know, but then it, then it went into all this other type of healing, so that people, because, you know, it was, it was a traumatic experience for everybody, I mean, we're talking about being at the front line, and so, you know, seeing people get hurt, or seeing your relatives going to jail, or seeing your horse get killed. I mean, you know, it was a traumatic, it wasn't fun and games, you know. The stuff that was going on in camp, the, what, I, what I'm talking about was healing and, and it came up, you know, like I said, it was very organic. But there was a lot of traumatic stuff going on there because, you know, the DAPL security and and the North Dakota police and the you know the National Guard and Tiger Swan and whoever else was there harassing us and terrorizing us you know so it was it was a traumatic experience for a lot of people to you know be at the front line and see someone right next to you get shot with a rubber bullet and get hurt and, and you know and, the, and they were saying well they're rubber rubber bullets they don't really hurt well you get shot by one you know, in your head somewhere, you know, because they were aiming for people's, you know, they were doing headshots. And, and so the healing also involved, you know, how, how do we heal from all this, all this um, PTSD that so many have now, just from that, you know, and like having, I mean, just hearing about the day when they, when the, um, I don't know if it was the North Dakota police or the National Guard, but they they um, were taking down one of the, the camps, the most northern camp, and there was a sacred ceremony going on. The sacred set sweat lodge was happening, and they just tore it open and drug those people out of there, and then put a, and and when you're in the Anipi, you you know you you only have on your underwear and a towel, and so. They drug them out of there and put them in dog kennels in their underwear, you know. So the humiliation and the the violation of human rights. I mean, we have the right to pray. So every I thought this country allowed that, but not at Standing Rock. We weren't allowed to pray. In fact, the 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 um, propaganda that was coming out of Tiger Swan and the and the U.S. government was, we were jihadists. Our, our, our way of think I don't know our way of thinking about religion was you know how they how they make jihadists be they just um, 
what do you call it? They just over, you know, they make it sound like they're they're so religious, they're fanatics, and they're crazy, and they kill or whatever, you know. Well, they were trying to equate our people with that, and so and and so the local um, North Dakota police who who are mostly white. What do they know about Indian people? You know, they live am they live they live among probably 18 reservations, but know nothing about us in North and South Dakota. So what do they know? But they know what they hear on the news, and they know they hear that word jihadist. So they're like, oh, you know, and they got all bent out of shape. So the propaganda that went out against us, we were being terrorized. We, all we did was stand up for water. We had no weapons. We had no, all we had was our prayers and our strength to stand and, and be beaten and be shamed and being whatever they did to us. We had the strength to do that. They're the ones who terrorized us. And so where's the justice in this country that, every, you know, they're all fighting terrorism all over the world, but they're the terrorists. So that doesn't, that doesn't fit. And so, I mean, uh, you know, it was, it was definitely a, um, another, I mean, like I said, I grew up in activism, so I understand this government in terms of um, protecting their, their hate and greed and lies. But I also, uh, Standing Rock, was um, one of the things that I saw there and I was just like, oh, you poor Americans. Because they literally threw the Constitution out the window. They violated every constitutional right that we have as Americans. Because we're Americans. They, they made us Americans back in the 30s. It wasn't our choice. They made us Americans so that they could uh, manipulate the rest of our land base. It wasn't our choice to be Americans. So we have American status. So we should have, you know, which the whole reason why they, you know, kill the Indian, save the man was to turn us into them. So we would assume that we are protected by their laws, but we're not. And Standing Rock was an example of that. The Constitution meant nothing. And it wasn't just Indian people whose constitutional rights were violated because it was not just Indian people who were there. There's people from all over the world, people from all over America, and their constitutional rights were violated. Civil rights, human rights, all of it was in, you know. And so, you know, it's like, what the hell? America could get away with anything, anything. Why is that? It's because they refuse to be a part of the UN in meaningful ways, you know? Well, where's the rest of the world making this country accountable? You know, what, what's everybody afraid of? Why not be the human being that we're meant to be and be honest? Why not? Why can't we be honest? You know, what's so hard about the American government to be honest? Just be honest, you know? <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, I, it was definitely a, a um, powerful, powerful experience. Like when the veterans came, it was so amazing. Thousands and thousands of U.S. veterans you know, came to protect us. And that blows my mind. It's the first time that I know of in our history that the U.S. military came to our aid. And I have a lot of respect for those veterans that came. I didn't get to meet all of them, but they were all ages and they were from all over, you know, all over, the, all over this country, and and they came and they said, "Okay, you guys rest now. We'll take the front line." 
And I knew then they were ready to die again. And that's why I'll have, always have respect for them because they were ready to stand for us. And I've never seen that. I've never even heard of that, of the U.S. military standing up for us. So, they, and, and I really believe that if they didn't come, Obama would have done nothing. Because he wasn't doing anything. And he said, I'm going to let this play out. And he knew Trump was going to push it through anyway. Everybody knew that, you know. So why, why do anything? And I can understand that, why he did that. But I, can, I think if the veterans didn't come, he wouldn't have made a decision. I think the reason why he had to was not because of us, not because of, you know, trying to help Indian people. He did it because he didn't want, I'm sure he was getting pressure, but I'm sure the United States government didn't want to have a black guy by their own veterans. And so I think that's the only reason why Obama said, hold up, this ain't happening, we gotta stop this right now. So the veterans that came to, that stood for Standing Rock, I will always have respect for them. I don't know them all, but I pray for them and their families because they protected mine. So that was meaningful. And then when the clergy came, you know, and, and burnt the doctrine of discovery, you know, that was so, there was so many powerful things that happened there that the rest of the world doesn't know or hasn't heard of because the media that was going out was, oh, they're all mad and they're all, they're all jihadists or they're all whatever that, you know, the media that was going out, it was all negative, you know, and, and the big media like CNN and all those guys, they didn't come till way later, you know, when they, you know, I was really impressed when Lawrence O'Donnell came. He did a really good piece, you know, a really good piece on what was happening. And then people started looking around and, you know, the big media was like, oh, maybe we should be over there, you know. And they still twisted it. They still put their own spin on it, you know. And, and they interviewed people, I mean, again, it became very clear who was controlling what. And the U.S. government and the Tiger Swan and all, all these groups that are allowed to exist in this country, um, they got to do what they wanted and they controlled a lot of the images and the media that went out. So, again, it's, it's, it, I don't know, it was just, it was just a, you know, on all, I learned, I learned a lot of things on a lot of different levels, but I also, um, appreciate the generosity of the world and the commitment of all these different groups of people that came. And the veterans and, and clergy are just two that I mentioned. You know, every indigenous nation came in North America. And then the world sent, sent their prayers and sent their, you know, words to us. So, it's definitely... So, you know, how do you end you know and for many of us it, it hasn't and for many of us we, we remember those prayers that were brought we can't just oh well it's done and walk away from the prayers because people brought them in good faith they brought them with a purpose so we have to remember those prayers if nothing else at least remember that because it's the world that came to Standing Rock to pray. And so, it's not over. And it's not over on a lot of levels. I mean, the camp is gone. Everybody's been evicted. But the racism in North and South Dakota is off the charts. And so the hate crimes are, but you don't hear about those, you know, that's been happening to our people 
all along. But you, it's not in the media, it's not, you know, but it's worse now. The profiling and, you know, even if you weren't involved in Standing Rock as an Indian person, you're being profiled, you're being harassed, you know, it's, on every level it's getting, it's worse now. I mean, we're back to not being served in restaurants and not being, being you know, not being able to shop in certain stores and can't park here. I mean, you know, the racism is crazy now, but nobody knows that because Standing Rock is over. But it's not over for us, and it'll never be over, because not only was it about the water, it was about the treaty obligations. And all that's all we have. We, you know, all we have is our treaties and our land and our water and our lives. So it's never going to be over for us. And there'll probably be another standing rock because KXL is right over there that's going to be coming down the road. You know, they, Trump was like, okay, yeah, do that. You know, that's two miles from our reservation border on this west end. So there's a camp over there now. Man camps popping up here and there, you know. So we have to figure out how to protect our our young people, our young women, our, our boys, you know, we have to, what are we going to do with these man camps nearby, spreading drugs and sex trafficking and murder and all that, you know, so it's a whole nother, you know, it's, it's never over for us because the government still wants these little tiny pieces of land they put us on, they still want that even. And they'll do whatever it takes to get all of it. And so we have to, it's never over. But it will be if, if there's no clean water. It's over for everybody. You know, we're done if there's no clean water. Only the rich are going to figure out where they're going to, you know, they'll have all the resources to make clean water, whatever. But what about us who don't? And it, it's not just Indian people, it's poor people. It's people who don't have access. So, it's, you know, it's, it, it's not over. And, it, and, and in people's minds, it shouldn't be until we all have clean water, clean air, and healthy food. And I think those are human rights, if I, if I remember correctly. <laughs> you know, I think every human being has the right to life, water, food, so, you talked about coming from a family of activists and like this being a continuation, but kind of how does it all come together for like moving forward for you? Well, what I've learned in a life of activism is. There's always a need. First of all, activism is not, um, it's not something that people support freely. And because of the media that goes out about it, like, like I said with Standing Rock, water protectors is a dirty word. Just like, just like back in the AIM days, if you were AIM, you were, it, it's a dirty word. And so the negative, you know, con connotations that are attached to being an activist, that's what's emphasized rather than the work that we're doing. And so many, many, many people do not even know or have an idea of how much work the American Indian Movement did that has a, had an effect on policy in Indian country. No one, you know, they all think, oh, they just, all they like to do is sing the AIM song and, and fight, or, you know, all they want to do is protest. But that's to get people's attention, and then you do the work. And so I think when you ask about it coming together, it's, it's um, 
I don't know if, if coming together makes sense to me because it's always a work in progress. It's always a work in progress because we have to educate the next generation or each other about what the issues are, who's working on it, what needs to be done next, how do we help. And that's always the issue. And so with the American Indian Movement, when all the leadership were targeted by the U.S. government and were, you know, like they do in other countries, they go wipe out all the leadership, put everybody in jail or kill them or, you know, buy them off or whatever. So that had an effect on the move, on the movement of red people, you know, Indian people being empowered. So when the leadership is gone, we're like, okay, who's next? Who's our next, you know, we got to find our next leaders and we got to keep this moving and moving. And meanwhile, people are falling away like, I got, li I got a life to live, I want to go, you know, whatever the reasons are. So it's always a work in progress. So like Standing Rock created a whole, you know, a whole other generation or two of, of thinking individuals, thinking in the reality of this world, of living in the United States, of being an Indian person, what does that mean? Now we know, we've seen it, we know what it means. And so we have a whole other group of activists. And so um, continuing that work of educating each other and, and deciding which one of those issues you're gonna, you're gonna be involved in. You know, because there's so many. We can't be everywhere. But there's enough of us now that maybe we can. You know, like when I was, when I was, um, during Standing Rock, I went to an ed in American Indian Education Conference or something like that. And they had a, they had a, a panel of people who were at Standing Rock, and I was on that panel. And many of them were so concerned about coming to Standing Rock, you know, we, you know, how long do you think it's gonna go on? Do you think I can get there in time? And you know, like that. And I was like, I was like, um, it's not about just the pipeline. It's about what you can do here, organize here. You know, the whole divestment movement that came out of Standing Rock, that's huge. And they're, they're doing, they're actually making, you know, progress. They're getting, they're getting, they're getting people to divest from banks that support fossil fuel industry. They're, they're, you know, bringing awareness to these large banks, and the and the banks are pulling out of, you know, how many of them have pulled out of Dapple? How many of them have pulled out of KXL? So, you don't have to be on the ground like this, you know. You can work in your communities and support those areas that are gonna have a meaningful impact on the issue. And so, that's the kind of work we need to be doing everywhere. We don't all have to be in Standing Rock. We don't all have to live on a reservation. We don't all have to, you know, just let's organize where we are and organize something meaningful and move forward so that it works to the common goal. So um, I guess that I guess that's that's my idea of, of it all coming together. Is, what we can do where we are and just you know help be a good relative you know like the lesson that standing up had at least for me was be a good relative and, you know pray so so i continue i will you know I'm, i grew up aim i'll die aim you know i um I teach my children and I let them make their own decisions. You know, I I help where I can, I support where I can, you know. So and I've learned a lot of lessons on a lot of different levels. And so I, I try to live my life the best way I can and support the people I can. And that's all we can do. You know, we don't have to I've seen I've seen my um, I've seen my mother give most of her life to the American Indian Movement and many times she stands alone, many times, with nothing, you know.
know. And being her daughter, I, I experienced that with her. You know, as a child, having nothing. But she's standing for justice for our people. Alone. It's her and her kids. There's nowhere to stay or no you know what I mean? So I've seen the effects of of I've seen and felt the effects of activism and it's not supported like like standing up was. So it's an uh, but it's also a choice. You know, my mo my mother cho chose to stand up for her people, and so we had we experienced that as young people. But we we chose to continue with her. You know, so it's a choice that we have to make. And so I I don't like I said I don't know if um, if it ever comes together. I don't know what that means. All I know is that it's it's never ending for us. It's a, it's ongoing always because we are a population of people that that for some reason are not um, allowed to have justice. So therefore, where does that leave us? We're in a constant fight for it. So I guess it comes together when the rest of the world stands up for us or I don't know I don't know you know even that even if that happened you know there's always a group of people in this world who needs what we need justice and unfortunately it's by the same hands so it, it's it's an ongoing situation that will probably be ongoing for our people for many generations to come so I hope that there will be many more standing rocks. Because <laughs> it's an instant education situation where this is what it's about and this is how, you know. Because everybody was just empowered and being good relatives and went home feeling good, you know. And still want to do something. That's what it's about. So I hope there are still, you know. I'm pretty sure there will be. There's been one in almost every generation, you know, at least among our people, there's been a huge situation where, like, Standing Rock has happened. So, so that's what I, you know, that's my thing. I, I, I miss Standing Rock. I wish I drive by there sometimes and I get really lonesome. But I always remember that's also a place where there's a lot of prayer. And it was before then. The history of that land where camp was, it was a place of prayer. So it, it made sense. You know, it makes sense. So I always think of that. That's just, and the world came there to pray, sent their prayers for water. The world, you know. So I'm proud of that. I'm proud to be part of the Ochanti Shakoi. You know, to have the world the come to our lands. Thank you so much for sharing. Yep, I'm sorry it went so long. <laughs> no, that was amazing. That yeah, was so was smooth. <laughs> um, are there any oh. last few words you want to add just to wrap up? Mm -hmm. I think we didn't ask that you want to talk about. Or you <laughs> well, I, um, <coughs> I hope that the people who see these interviews um, at least see my interview. The thing that, that I um, want to express is pray and be a good relative because that helps everybody. And you know, that's, we have to, we have to, we have to be good relatives if we want to see our young people, you know, the next generations live in a way that, I mean, we need clean water and clean air and good food, you know, so why don't we be good relatives and work toward that for everybody, you know, and, you know, believe that the earth is our mother, truly believe it, not not just say it because everybody else is saying it, 
but truly believe it. She is our mother. She loves us. She wants to live. She gives us everything. So why don't we give some back? Why don't we take care of her? You know, simple as that.